Hi everyone, my name is Stefan. Welcome to Fossi Dial Up. Um, today is the second to last episode for this year. Um, we will be joined by Matt Goodhouse talking about Open RAM for Skywater PDK. We had a lot of really great presentations so far around Skywater PDK, which is an open source variant of, um, of the previous commercial PDK. And yeah, one of the missing links that, that I wanted to learn <laughs> more about was, um, was the RAM, right? Which is very important to build the system on chip. And yeah, Matt will join us today. To talk about it, um, he's a professor at UCSC. Um, he has been working on Open RAM long before that, and yeah, let's switch in to to Matt. Hi, Matt. How are you doing? Fine. Yeah. Um, could be better the weather, but it's getting winter now, so we had the whole summer of yeah. that. Now the winter is approaching for us in, in Munich. Snow around the mm. <laughs> Great to have you here. Uh, really looking forward to your presentation. I think everyone is really curious to learn more about um, RAM for, for the SOC. Um, I think that's a very important missing link. So here's the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, so I've been um, working on Open RAM for actually a, quite a few years now. Um, and it's turning into a bigger project every time I take a new aspect of it. So it's an exciting thing and it's an exciting time for it. Um, so I'm eager to present this to you all. So I'm a professor at UC Santa Cruz. I'm actually about 30 miles from San Jose, Silicon Valley area, kind of over the mountains on the coast there. Um, you notice I run the VLSI design and automation lab. So we focus on EDA tools and, and circuits and things like that. So I've previously done stuff with clocking and I've now focused on memories for quite a number of years now. Now, if you notice um, in my logo, the S looks a little funny. Um, that is a banana slug. Um, actually, I'll go to this. Uh, we are the banana slugs. Um, the picture on the left is actually something I took near campus um, on a run. And you know, it's actually our mascot. You can see me below with it. Um, it's famous for the t-shirt in Pulp Fiction that John Travolta wore, wore. And if you're a sci-fi fan, there's actually a new mini series called Debs that was actually just filmed on campus a year or so ago. And it premiered in, in January. If you want to get a view of some of the buildings, that was literally my background. Debs was in along this hallway. So um, just a little bit about UCSC. Now about me, so I'm in the, a professor of computer science and engineering. I'm also the Dean of Graduate Studies. So I'm in charge of all the engineering graduate programs. So you might say, oh, wait, a dean giving a talk on a technical stuff. I, I'm actually a dean that codes. So you can ask my students. I like writing code. I'm down in the details. I like to get dirty with stuff. So yes, a dean that codes. Um, as I mentioned, I've done previous stuff with clock tree synthesis, timing variability and optimization. Um, the one thing that everyone keeps recognizing my name for is actually the MyBench embedded benchmarks. That's been cited like 4,000 times and people use it for security stuff. That was actually one of my master's projects back in school. So you never know when a project will get legs and kind of be recognized. <clears throat> so my main interest is I'm not a hardware designer or a software engineer. I'm either one, depending on the situation. Um, so I like to do circuits, physical design and algorithms to basically do electronic design automation. And that's what I'm all about. I try to be both a hardware guy and a software guy, but also neither. So. What is a memory compiler? So I, um, you know, the name of compiler is actually a bad one. It comes from the era of silicon compilers before they had synthesis in place and route. Um, so it is a compiler, but not in a code sense. It's basically a program to create memory designs because you wanna create a memory for different um, situations, different sizes of memories, different purposes of memories. So you know, things like caches, buffers, register files. Sometimes as a designer, you're just given memory IP and you, you, you know, intellectual property IP, and you're just given a memory and say, this is the memory you get to use. But um, a memory compiler adds a little more flexibility to that to let you customize a memory. Now, the idea is that these, this, these memory outputs can be used in a place and route design flow, like on the right here. Um, they're an input as the design library. And so they can be used with um, synthesis and PNR tools. Now, 
why is a memory compiler different than digital design, like this flow on the right? Well, the problem is it's a mix of analog and digital design. It's not purely a di digital design, but it's also not a, a extra analog design like designing amplifiers and, and filters and things like that. Now, along with this, because it's kind of a mix of digital and analog design, there's many trade-offs. And on the bottom here, I kind of wrote, this is the famous Rezavi octagon of amplifier trade-offs. It shows that there's all these different components like noise and supply voltage and voltage swing, speed, power. Many of these also apply to memory design, but memory is also um, very much constrained by area. That's really the driving thing. How many bits can you fit in a given chip area and, and still have reliability and performance and all these things. So that's what makes it a challenging problem. And I, I must admit, since I started the OpenRAM project, I've started to see the nuances of how challenging it truly is. And I keep peeling back layers and seeing further difficulties and challenges. And it's a very good learning experience as well. So what is the state of the art? Um, memory compilers are not new. Um, almost every company either uses a memory compiler or has their own. Um, many of the big um, high performance companies will make their own memory compiler and have a team that does it. Um, many of the EDA companies have tools to assist with memory compile, comp compilation. Um, there's also businesses that actually just provide memory IP and different processes, um, you know, like ARM and, and things like that. Um, the issue with a lot of these is they're not open source um, and everyone tends to, you know, have to reinvent the wheel, right? These memory compilers kind of do certain functions, but if everyone has their own, they don't, can't really share code and so on. Now, the reason that is, is there's a huge variety in what people actually call a memory compiler. Some people will have a script that just lays out a regular array of things and say, oh, I've got a, in, in for example, a commercial layout tool, and they'll say, oh, it's a memory compiler. But there's all these other aspects of memory compilation, such as timing characterization, um, optimization, sizing, things like this, that you can actually have a very um, complicated memory compiler that does a lot of things you know, beyond just a simple script. Now, there are some open source things. I mentioned um, here FabMem, which is for one process, FakeRAM, which just generates kind of black box models for memories, but doesn't actually make memories. There's some scripts like pot still, and there's a branch, a fork off of OpenRAM called the asynchronous memory compiler. You know, there aren't a lot of um, options in the open source that actually do the full thing of, you know, making a memory all the way down to the layout level. And why is that? Well, I'll talk about that in a second. So why would you actually want to have an open source memory compiler? Well, there's a lot of IP cores. You know, if you go to open cores and GitHub now, you can find all of these designs. Those are free, but they all use memories, but they don't have the memories with them. So their memories are used in all of these designs. In addition to that, they're a, a bottleneck for both the performance and the power. So they, they are critical to the actual quality of that design and they limit it. And you may think, okay, they have a regular structure. So they're easy to automate with caveats. And we have now open cell libraries and process design kits such as Sky 130, but we really don't have open source memory IP yet. And so that's the gap that you know, open source um, tools with like OpenRAM can do. So this is kind of the optimistic approach, you know, half full. This is what we can provide. You'll ask a lot of circuit designers and, and memory circuit designers in particular, and they'll say, well, I'm gonna be a pessimist. You know, why don't we want a memory compiler or why can't we? Well. The biggest issue is that bit cells for the highest density are proprietary. Um, lithography and design rule waivers and things like that are critical to getting the, the most uh, bits, the most density, the number of bits per area. Well, OpenRAM, we've, we're basically allowing it to be flexible where you can use either a foundry provided bit cell that is really optimized for area. We'll talk about this coming up or you can actually use user design rules as well and make your own bit cells. Um, the other criti uh, criticism that you'll get is that memories need to be silicon proven. Um, you don't really know the performance of a memory until you tape it out because characterization of memories is very slow and prone to inaccuracies. So we're gonna also try to, to address this by taping out designs in open source processes. Um, another issue is that design rules typically aren't accessible. Um, this is being overcome with these open PDKs. 
And then finally, most designers don't want to get into the details of designing a memory. I mentioned that octagon of all these trade-offs of noise and performance and so on. Designers have enough with their hands full with a large digital design and making sure it works to worry about whether the memory itself works. So um, they just want to have flexible and customizable memories. So that's kind of the negative parts. So we don't let that stop us though. Um, I feel like there's a space for open RAM and open RAM is trying to get into the space where we can kind of glue together the circuit optimization stuff, but hide it from the high level designers and give them a flexible um, uh, use case. So with that, I've kind of revised these over the time, but the guiding principles behind open RAM are to be usable by hardware engineers. So this includes architects and memory designers to be extensible by both hardware engineers and software engineers. Once we give a piece of code to software engineers and make it, let them extend it, they can do some amazing things. And I want to be able to have it be extensible in that way. I also want it to be maintainable though. I mentioned a lot of memory compilers tend to be these one-off scripts that just do a couple things. And those are not maintainable code. And that, for that reason, they typically just get thrown away after one process node. Um, so we want this to be a software infrastructure that is maintained and used for many technology nodes. And that leads to number four, actually be portable to different technologies. Um, many compilers work in one technology, whereas the goal of OpenRAM is to work in any technology with hopefully the minimal amount of porting. That's not always the case. It can be a challenge to port, but we're trying to learn as we port to new processes and, um, and make that less painful. And then finally, OpenRAM is open source. So we want it to be independent of specific tools or methodologies. What do I mean by this? I want OpenRAM to be able, it does work with open source tools and commercial tools. Now the open source people in FOSSI may be like, oh, why do you want to work with commercial tools, right? The issue is a lot of companies rely on commercial tools and we want to have them be able to contribute back to OpenRAM, which can then ultimately benefit the open source tools as well. So I feel like to get the most contribution and input from users, we want to be independent of any one particular flow to let the contributions come back. Now, OpenRAM itself, um, it's a BSD three clause license. You know, some companies are a little shy of GPL and so, so on. So we keep it fairly liberal. Right now we have, uh, it's been uh, released with two technologies, free PDK 45, which is a 45 nanometer non-fabrical technology. Um, MOSIS scalable CMOS. This used to be like a TSMC 0.35 micron, but TSMC stopped really supporting it. And this talk is about introducing the um, Skywater 130 nanometer um, support for OpenRAM. And the idea is um, OpenRAM provides a timing and power characterization methodology, functional verification methodology for memories. It generates all of the layout, spice net lists, Verilog models, DR does DRC and LVS verification and then um, does the uh, LEF and library views for synthesis in place and route. Now, to maintain techno independence of tools, we basically provide wrapper scripts around open source tools and we let them interface through those. That's primarily for simulation, DRC and LVS. Everything else is pretty much done internally to OpenRAM. Um, so as you see here, this is a general flow for OpenRAM. The wrappers kind of hide the, um, the tools like SPICE, DRC, LVS extraction. It takes as input some um, technology parameters. So a subset of the design rules that it can use to generate some layout on the fly. It's important that it takes in a set of custom cells. Typically these are gonna be the bit cells, a flip-flop for synchronization of the interface and then sense amplifier and things like that. So a few custom cells that you really want to you know, minimize the area of especially the bit cell to get the biggest density of um, a memory. And then a config user configuration script that says, what kind of memory do I wanna generate? Now, the other thing we do is actually let you, um, I'll talk about later, you can provide custom module overrides to actually replace parts of OpenRAM with other um, design styles. And then OpenRAM takes all this and generates your typical IP deliverables from layout, LEF, Verilog simulation models and so on. Now, a configuration file for OpenRAM, it's, we chose just to use Python rather than JSON or another language or another format. Um, 
Why Python? Well, this will let people script on top of it. And it's easy to do since OpenRAM is already written in Python. Um, you know, if you look in here, a typical configuration will have the, the few parameters at the top here, like the technology name, the number of words. So a data, a data item is called a word, like in most microarchitectures, the number of words. You can specify some other parameters like the local array size. I'll talk about those. Number of banks, number of column muxes, and so on. Um, but that's the basics you need for a memory. Then the later options let you basically do things like specify the voltages and temperatures to characterize it at. Um, you can actually um, set the output load and input SLU for characterization. You can store the results. And then at the last line, you can basically override, for example, a, a circuit in me the memory. You know, If you want to make your own custom decoder module, instead of our decoder module, you can actually override that with your own Python um, uh, module for OpenRAM using our API. Now, how do we design, how do we kind of um, use OpenRAM? Well, the way I envision it, there's actually two users of OpenRAM, two classes. You have the fast people and the slow people. The fast people are gonna be your computer architects. These people just want to know, you know, how fast is the memory? How much area is it? Maybe even what are the pin locations so I can use it? Um, you don't need to do a lot for, to get those um, views. Uh, we, Open, we have the front end mode of OpenRAM where you can basically generate this without doing any DRC, LVS, or simulation. But you know, there's gonna be risks of maybe there is a DRC error in there with that configuration. So it's not uh, necessarily verified. Similarly, um, estimates are, are provided using a model similar to like a cacti type model, but you have to calibrate this depending on the process. So if it's not calibrated in your technology setup, the estimates are gonna be bad. We're working on ways of auto calibrating this. Um, one of my students is working on that. Now, if you actually wanna tape out the design or you're a memory designer, you actually wanna do the backend mode where you actually generate all the detailed layout and you perform ver verification. So this includes the DR DRC and LVS, but then also power and delay um, modeling simulation, either back annotated with parasitics or not. Now, this is, I did it in these two modes because by default, if someone downloads OpenRAM and we use the backend mode, I get this question all the time. They run something that starts characterizing and it'll take a day because characterizing memories is slow. And um, that's probably the number one question I'm asked. So by default, we ship with the front end mode so you can get estimates and people can run it and kind of see how it works. And then you turn on the back end mode to get more accurate um, uh, output from OpenRAM. So what is the architecture like? Well, OpenRAM provides, and I'm gonna go over some of these in, in a little detail, but it provides basically a, a bit cell array. We have um, a model where you can actually have local bit cell arrays to make larger memories. Um, there's also an option to do banking. Um, I'll talk a bit about that in the future. And now using the bit cell array, you basically can make, have address ports and data ports up either one or two. And you can see on the address port basically does the address decoding to turn on rows of the bit cell array. The data port um, does the pre-charging and sensing to be able to access the bit cell. And then you also have a bunch of uh, control logic to actually synchronize and do all of that, those operations. So OPERAM provides um, basically um, the circuits and models and it implements all of these components to make a memory. Now, the other thing that OpenRAM ships with, and this is you know, something that's important, is we want, it actually has significant uh, regression and continuous integration. So it uses the Python unit test framework and it does code coverage and so on. And the intent is that we want to be able to guide people in porting to new technologies. So we have unit testing that builds from the lower level unit tests up to the entire SRAMs and characterization of SRAMs. Um, Roughly about 80% code coverage runs in about 60 minutes. I think that's crept up in the last week or so to like an hour and a half. But we try to keep it in about an hour, which some CI people might say, oh, that's horrible. But remember, we, we have to verify interfaces to simulation and all this. And so it's actually a challenging problem. Um, so it does, yeah, both timing simulation, functional simulation. And this also checks the portability. Um, for example, we run both uh, free PDK and SCMOS uh, continuous integration at the same time. And ultimately we're gonna add the Sky 130 in there as well once it's uh, stable. 
So this is an important part of OpenRAM is to actually make it maintainable. Remember, one of the goals is to have it be maintainable by software engineers. You need to know if you broke something. So what are some of the baseline features of OpenRAM? Well, a little bit of um, uh, SRAM 101. I know we have a lot of software people and people that may not be VLSI designers. So we basically use a bit cell. By default, it's a 60 bit cell with um, a differential output. So you basically have a bit line and a bit line bar. So the opposite to access a cell. Um, the bit cell itself is usually a back to, basically a back-to-back -back inverter. So it's static, it's, all, it's driving itself. And then you have these switches that are turned on by the word line to either connect the bit cell to the, the bit lines or not. And at the transistor level, this basically looks like this. This is why it's a 6T cell. So you actually see the, um, the two back-to-back -back inverters, M1 through M4. Now, the part that becomes challenging, I mentioned that it's not digital design, it's analog design, is how this cell works is somewhat analog. In order to actually do a read, you have to pre-charge the bit lines and then you turn on the word line. And you wanna make sure that the cell can be read without being overwritten. So that's the um, static noise margin or the read noise margin of the bit cell. If you were, were to read it and it was to disrupt the value of the bit cell, you can't store memory, right? You can't read memory. So that's an important criteria. Similarly, you have to be able to overdrive this static bit cell to be able to program it to a different value. So there's also the right noise margin, which means the bit lines have to be able to overpower this as well. So the device sizes in this have to be carefully balanced in order to have a both readable and writable uh, memory cell. And then the timing of this is also critical. If you turn on the word line when you're not intending to do a read, you may corrupt the value in the bit cell. And, and, and that's, that's a, a bad thing, obviously. So how do you then get multi-port bit cells. Well, really that back-to-back -back inverter that we just showed is still used in multi-port bit cells, but you can basically layer on these um, access transistors. So the ones that access that connect to the bit line and have more bit lines. This example shows in blue, um, the blue square is basically the previous 6T cell you just saw. Then if you look at red, you can add transistors N5 and N6 in this case, which also access the static feedback inverters and have their own bit lines. And this is a write-only port, which means it's not necessarily the sizing of N5 and N6 may be a little different than the N3 and N4 transistors in the read-write port. Similarly, the green square shows a read-only port where you can actually have a, um, a decoupled read port where, by having this extra transistor so that there's not a direct connection through a pass transistor to the bit cell itself. And that provides a little more um, um, scalability or noise margin for the memory cell itself. So you can extend this to multiple ports is an important point to take away from this, but it's really critical that these um, cells be designed carefully and used appropriately. We can also accommodate foundry bit cells. And what I mean by that is the optimized bit cell for a particular process technology. So if we look at this, this is actually some of the Skywater 130 um, bit cells. So you can see here on the top, um, we show the top left is the single port bit cell. So that's with just uh, two access transistors and the cross coupled um, inverters. You can see kind of a, a um, if I draw on this, you can see kind of the cross coupling with this uh, local interconnect metal layer that is actually gonna do that. And so just to illustrate that. Now on the bottom here, the word lines through this device are actually on polysilicon um, I believe they're through here and here. And so we, that leads us to this next cell down here, which is actually a single port cell with straps. And so what do you mean by straps? Well, this is actually connecting the polysilicon here and here together, and then routing it up to a metal layer. And this is basically for performance reasons where we wanna have the word lines in metal to connect um, with less resistance and capacitance. Um, now, there's an area overhead to adding those straps. Typically, they're only added periodically through a memory array, um, but it's in this case, I'm coupling it with the bit cell. Now, in, um, for dual port, that's the same idea as before, where I said you could add an extra access, pair of access transistors and a separate bit line. So it's a little bit bigger than the si single port cell because you have two more access transistors and two more bit lines. And you can still see kind of the cross coupling 
of the back-to-back -back inverters is taken care of by that local interconnect metal. Now, this port, dual port also has straps to connect the bit line, and it also has an extra kind of poly just for um, uniformity when you flip cells to basically make the, the lithography a little prettier. Um, these are basically dummy poly lines on the, the ends. Now, adding those straps and so on makes the cell bigger, but again, you'll typically want to um, put those periodically through the array rather than at every cell. Now, just for reference on the right here, we have the layout of the DFF from, it was originally the OSU standard cell library that James talked about last week with a few, um, few modifications. But you can see that, you know, the single port bit cell to this DFF is probably like a five or six X area difference. The dual port is, you know, ballpark four X difference. And so that's a very, that's why you wanna use memories is basically if you synthesize a design with a memory in flip-flops, it's gonna be big. And so you want to optimize for area by using the custom bit cells. Now, one of the challenges that we've ran into with OpenRAM is that these bit cells also have um, OPC in them. So this is why, what I mean by OPC is this is optical proximity correction. So it's extra features to help it print better when you actually go to silicon. And it's really challenging to design memories because of that. And you basically have to go through the simulation of the printing process and the photo resist process to actually verify that it will print correctly. And these bit cells actually include that information in it. So they include OPC. Now that's good and bad. We don't have the recipe to actually make the OPC right now. So we're trying to use the provided bit cells with it pre-made. And that means that, for example, the dual port, the OPC uh, needs to have these straps around it in order to be correct. Um, and so for the dual port implementation, I'm actually using this dual port cell with straps for the array. For the single port, we're basically um, changing that and we're going to uh, use, we're adding the strap for every bit cell at first, but we can also uh, intersperse it um, later on with a custom array. So that's one challenge is dealing with the OPC when we're using this. Now, oop, gotta clear this. Now, how are these bit cells then used? Another little SRAM 101 in the, in the memory array. Well, I mentioned the word line axis is a row and in, you can see that in blue on the right. Um, this axis has two different memory columns, one in red, one in orange. And then you can have a column mux to be able to have more than one word in a row. So it's kind of a 2D array, but then you can add a third dimension by being able to do this partially selecting of a row with the column mux. Now, why do you wanna do that? Well. The delay of a memory array is actually proportional to two components. One is actually the word line delay. So if you have a very wide memory, it's gonna take a long time to drive that word line to all of the, the bit cells in a row. And so if it's too wide, it's gonna to be too slow. But then the bit lines are vertical and the capacitance of those is actually uh, critical to performance as well. Um, perhaps even, it's actually even more critical actually. So if you get it too tall of an array, basically a single bit cell has to be able to charge and discharge some of this, the capacitance on this bit line and before you can actually read the value out. So the critical thing with kind of doing trade-offs of a memory is you don't want to let the word line delay or the bit line delay uh, dominate. So you kind of want not quite a square memory array, but something that's perhaps a little shorter and wider and a little wider, but to optimize delay, you kind of want to not let either word line delay or bit line delay dominate. So that's why you add the column muxing is to be able to trade off the number of things in a row for the height. And the next thing is, I mentioned that the bit line is a significant part of delay is you have to implement a sensing scheme to not require that the memory cell actually charge and discharge the entire bit line capacitance. So the delay of the bit line is gonna be proportional to the capacitance of the bit line and essentially times the, the uh, voltage difference divided by the I average. So I average is basically the amount of current that a bit cell can drive or, or either drive onto or pull off of the bit line. And you wanna basically induce a change in voltage on the bit line with a tiny cell, right? So big capacitance bit line, tiny cell. And when you, you're gonna basically pre-charge the bit lines and you can see here, when you turn on the word line, you're gonna access a memory cell and it's gonna start discharging 
either one of the bit lines, either bit line or bit line bar. But because it's a, a memory cell doing this, it's gonna be a very slow discharge. And that what you want to do to speed up the performance is we have to use what's called a sense amplifier to be able to sense this voltage difference between the bit line and the bit line bar. So the Q and the Q bar nodes of the SRAM cell to, and speed that up. The sense amplifier assists this and actually gives you a faster read time. So the key here though, is this is where it's not quite digital design because when you turn on the word line and when you turn on the sense amp enable is critical to having a reliable read and a, a good performance. If you turn on the sense amp too early, um, you may be reading noise on the bit lines, you know, if it's not changed enough. If you turn on the sense amp too late, you're gonna be giving up performance and your design will be slower than you want it. So this is actually where kind of the trade-off comes in is, you know, when to turn on the sense amp, when to turn on the word line and so on. So it's reliability versus performance. How do we do that in open RAM? Well, we're using a technique called replica bit line sensing. And what we do here is when we have uh, memory, we actually add an extra column as shown in red here and an extra row as shown in blue. And the entire purpose of this red column is actually not to store a value, but because all of the bit cells in there are actually slightly modified from the other bit cell to be always programmed with a, a zero value. So we basically just tie that one of the inverters to zero so that it always has that value. And then what happens is when you turn on this replica bit line word line on the bottom, it's actually gonna turn on this bit cell and start discharging the bit line to reading a zero. Now, also we're gonna turn on one of the word lines in the memory. So you actually have two of these bit cells on at a time and they're gonna start discharging together the bit line. What we do is we use this as kind of a, a canary to determine when to turn on the sense amps for the rest of the bit lines. Because this is discharging at least twice as fast, you can actually change the number of these bit cells to program that. Um, we don't do that right now, but you could add that. And that's a technique that's known. And you can basically discharge that. And when it gets to a certain value, it's gonna um, have a hit the switching point of an inverter and actually we'll use that in the control logic to then turn on the sense amplifiers of all of the other cells that don't have multiple replica bit cells on. Now, we also add in here a delay line. This is actually to account for basically the additional delay of the decoder circuitry and to match that. And then this turns on the sense and amp sense enable signal for all of the rest of the columns. So we're basically, the good thing about this is it tracks voltage, temperature and process variations because we're using a part of the memory itself to generate the timing signals in order to turn on the other parts of the memory. And so it, you can also add this delay line to count for the decoder, but also to guard band it, to add a little bit of margin just in case. And that's a programmable thing that you can add to open RAM. And we actually add um, measurement stuff in simulation to kind of verify that these signals are correct. So when you're doing simulation, it'll actually report an error if this sense enable is not turned on at an appropriate time. Now, that's how to do reliable sensing. Uh, we also have, um, I mentioned that's for bit lines, which can dominate delay. The word line can also dominate delay. And we recently added um, hierarchical word lines to OpenRAM. What this means is that there's not actually a single word line, but it's actually a tree where you have a local bit cell array with the, all the memory cells, and then a local driver to drive that local bit cell array. And then you have a bunch of those local bit cell arrays that implement a larger global bit cell array. So the idea is that once you have multiple levels of hierarchy in this word line, you can decrease the delay of it because otherwise the word line gets really long, high capacitance, and it slows down. And so this, this is, uh, a well-known optimization technique. And we basically let you configure this. You can specify a limit on the size of these local bit cell arrays. That was a configuration in the, the config file, or you can let OpenRAM kind of do it and figure out a good value. So we can add heuristics to give you good trade-offs there. Um, the next thing is that lets you make it a little wider with this hierarchical word line, how to get even bigger memories. Um, to do that, you need to have basically banks of multiple arrays. And you can see here, this is basically a two bank array. Um, the left and right side, you can see that the row decoder that, that selects the word line is shared among the two banks. So you can actually overlap some of the parts. They each have their own data port. And then 
there's a bank select that basically says which of these banks to drive onto a shared data bus. Um, if you look at the routing here, this is an older version, so it's a little um, big where we didn't have an optimized channel route before. Then these can also um, share the control logic. Now, um, OpenRAM has had the support of one, two, and four bank memories. We've actually temporar temporarily disabled it, so it really only does one bank right now. Um, we need to kind of um, get that back up to speed now that we've done a lot of these changes. Particularly changing to the hierarchical word line would affect, would interact with this. And that's why we kind of let that lapse a little bit. Um, in general, if you don't have banking in OpenRAM, what you can do is you can basically just have multiple instances of a memory and then write a Verilog wrapper around it to make big memories. The only thing you lose there is this, this shared part of the shared address decoder. You don't share that anymore each memory would have its own shared address. So it's not the end of the world, but it's a little less efficient when you have a big memory. Now, I talked about the single port bit cell and OPC earlier. This is actually a slide showing the Skywater 6T cell. Um, again, you can see that on the left, the full layers. On the right, you can basically see only three layers. So this is the polysilicon the and the diffusion and then the lo LI, local interconnect layer in TAN. So the red's poly, green is the diffusion, and then the LI is the tan, the tan color. So you can see the different assist features that come with this. You basically have a polysilicon mad, ad, mask add layer. This kind of goes along the edges of the poly to basically make the mask a little wider to make it print better, essentially. Um, you also see a, you know, a mask add, for example, on the ends of polysilicon, um, this is basically a hammerhead feature where you want to make the ends a little bit bigger so that you don't have rounding on the ends of the polysilicon. Um, you see similar things on the, the diffusion layer. Uh, you see the CFOM mask drop and mask add. Those basically make the mask a little bigger or a little smaller just to aid printing. Now, if you ran this through the normal user design, design rules, in OpenRAM, this is called the periphery design rules because this process used to be used for a lot of memory stuff. Periphery means out of the memory in this case, not necessarily IO. Um, this would not pass the, the regular user design rules, the periphery design rules, because these assist features actually let you make things smaller than normal. These transistors are actually smaller than the digital transistors in the design. Um, I forget the actual numbers. It's 0.21 micron width and 0.15 length, which th that's a little bit smaller than the normal digital transistor. Um, actually down to point one five width as well, I believe. I have to double check that. But so these basically allow you to have um, special DRC checking in the memory that has memory core rules. So there's actually a, a layer that surrounds this called the core ID mem layer that says, this is a memory. It already has OPC added. So don't add that like you have to do later to the digital design. And you can also have these different design rules for the memory cell itself. Okay, now what are some enhanced features in OpenRAM? Um, well, I mentioned before, we have uh, customized modules. So if you want to override a particular part of a memory, say a decoder, and you want to use your own decoder, if you want to do a specialized bit cell layout, you can, or bit cell array layout, you can actually make your own bit cell array layout for the technology. We did this to basically let people try different circuits. And the idea is we want to be flexible for designers so that you can have a high performance, you know, dynamic decoder for your memory, or you can have a lower performance, lower power one for a different type of memory. So this is to add um, flexibility in OpenRAM. Now, the other thing we've added recently is um, configurable write masking. So I mentioned we have column muxes, so you can have more than one word on a given row. We also have it, so that would write a portion of the row, but you can also write a portion of the word on the row. So for example, RISC-V architectures, typically have a 32-bit data word, but you want to be able to write one byte of that at a time. Um, otherwise, you'd have to basically do a read, modify the bit, write it back, and that would require two memory accesses and an, and an instruction to optimize, to actually do the a computation. So we added this um, to OpenRAM um, last year, um, and it basically selectively enables the write drivers to write a subset. The other columns are actually pre-charged and preserve the value that was previously in them. Um, this is actually complete. Some technologies, some memory compilers have a limit on what kind of write masking you can do. It, this is uh, 
basically completely configurable. You can do down to a, um, one or two bits. It depends on how wide this AND gate is compared to your bit cell. But you can do down to almost a bit um, masking, or you can do up to the whole word masking, obviously. That's the default. So that's in the existing code. Um, another thing we've been adding recently is people ask about built-in self-test and self-repair. This is a little bit in progress. Um, I've actually had a student that we actually generate the memory arrays where you can add spare columns and spare rows. And the spare, um, these spare rows and columns can be used when there's a def defect in one of the bit cells where you can actually do some address manipulation and access a, a different row or column instead of the actual row or column to use correct bits. Um, so we actually have the stuff on the right in OpenRAM where you can add these spare things and all the spare columns actually have their own SenseAmp and bypass the column mux. And then they also have their own write enable. Now the idea with this is OpenRAM is gonna take a, a soft wrapper approach to actually doing the BIST and the repair. So I have a student that did this for a master's project. We have the Verilog code on the left that actually does built-in self-test and then remapping of a certain set of addresses to different addresses in OpenRAM when there's a fault detected. Um, I mentioned that this is you know, in progress because we have the remapper working for fixed sizes. We just need to parameterize it and, um, and include it to, for um, working with other sizes. So the idea here is then all of this um, remapping stuff would get synthesized into, um, into standard cells as part of your core. Now we, we like to, this as an option because this obviously adds a performance hit because anytime you access the memory, you would have to go through the remapping logic. So some people may want to actually do self-repair test and repair, whereas other people may not want it. And so we don't do it as a custom implementation in, in um, the memory itself. Instead, it's a soft implementation. Now, the other thing we're going to be adding, um, we have this, but we haven't really released it yet. And we will soon because it's basically slow to characterize. So we've just been, and it, the OpenRAM has been fairly volatile in the past um, year or two, is the OpenRAM library IP. So we mentioned that not all designers want to actually you know, fiddle with a memory compiler. They don't want to port it to a new, te new technology and so on. So what we've been doing is we've looked through uh, a lot of the RISC-V architectures, you know, Pico RV32, Rocket, Boom. Um, there's a lot of interest in these architectures. What we're doing is basically taking these architectures and we're looking through the memories that these use. So these are all the memory options that most of these use. So Rocket Chip, you have your L1 cache, the tags and the data, the L2 cache. You can see the number of words in these. You can see the port types. So most of them have a single read write port. Others have one read, one write. Different write mask size and different word size. These are the different options you want to be able to generate memory arrays for this. Now note, the one in red here, that's a giant memory. So that's something you would definitely have to use banking for. Um, you can't generate that straight up with OpenRAM. I, I, that's the first thing I get with people when they just tr start using OpenRAM. They say, okay, OpenRAM, I want, you know, four megabytes of memory. It's going to not finish. I can guarantee that. So, um, you know, this type of thing, you need to do some sort of um, optimization. Uh, on the bottom here, you can see Pico RV32. This is um, Claire Wolf's project where um, you can see the register file is a small memory with one read, one write port. The SRAM scratch pad memory is uh, a 32 bit data word, a little bit deeper. This can be anywhere from a one kilobyte to a bigger memory, but it requires one read write port and write masking as well. Then finally, the boom chip, a bunch of um, memories as well. Again, L1 cache and data and tags. Things like the branch target buffer and counters can be implemented in memories. And we're gonna, we have configurations to basically generate all of these memories and we're gonna put them on the open, live, open RAM IP site at some point soon. Um, what does that library page look like? So again, this is not live yet because I was had dummy data here and people were reporting things were broken because it was dummy data. So all these areas are not necessarily accurate. Um, the idea is here, you can have a page, you can filter by technology, parameters. You can, these will be pre-characterized um, and we're gonna add Skywater as well. Right now it was just SCMOS and FreePDK. Um, and what I ultimately wanna do is basically have you know, anytime we have a new version of OpenRAM, it'll just redo all of these and put them on the website. And you can see here, it generates a data sheet, for example, with your normal stuff, your power and 
and timing information, operating conditions. It also has, for example, which Git commit ID this came from. So you can actually replicate which version of OpenRAM was used to generate this, if there's any DRC or LVS problems, and so on. So kind of known features. Now, let's get to a couple um, results. I'll kind of go through some of this fairly quickly. Um, this is one of the chips we did with eFabless. Um, this is uh, the Strive 2 chip. You can see here, this is also with uh, Mohammed uh, Shalam from uh, American University in Cairo. And you can see this is Pico RV32 through the open road and open lane uh, digital flow. This is a one kilobyte um, open RAM SRAM that was sent to Fab. It's been in process for the past um, few months, weeks, a while. It's a uh, the 32-bit core, a memory, PLL, a serial interface, and so on. Now, if you zoom in a little bit more on this memory, this is the dual port. Um, it's it, The goal of this tape out was basically functionality. So get something working, and then we can improve it later. Um, you can see here, there's some black space around this. This has a metal, I think, 234 turned off just for visibility of the array. The bottom here between the flops and the address is actually an unoptimized channel route. That's been fixed already in a newer version of OpenRAM, so it's much less. Overall, um, this had about 15 DRC errors in Sky130 that we just fixed by hand. Um, most of those were like the, um, the, the contact NPC enclosure um, spacing. Um, and so we kind of fixed those by hand. Also, the pins weren't fully on the parameter where they were near the perimeter, but not enough for the open lane flow. So they kind of um, hand placed those. Now we did a similar analysis. So that was using open road and open lane. This is what one of my students did with a um, commercial flow. And so you can see this is a synopsis design compiler with Cadence Innovis for place and route. And um, that previous result, we saw a significant area reduction comparing a flip-flop based implementation of the memory versus a custom implementation. We did the same thing here. So the left is basically synthesizing the memory array with flops. And then the right is actually using the um, SRAMs for the register file and for the data scratch pad memory. And you can see roughly those memories are about right here on the chip. And that was basically a 50% area reduction. And this is even though the memories you can see here are fairly inefficient in some of their layout, they're still much more efficient than DFS. So you don't have to make a good memory to make it smaller, but you can get a lot of improvement for a little bit. And you can see how that scales actually, as this is the number of bits on the horizontal axis and area. You can see basically the slope is the, you know, is the relative increase. You can see the tan line is if you use DFFs for a memory. The blue dash blue line is if you use a latches instead of DFFs. And then the purple line is if you use a custom bit cell. You can see this, this gets, the difference gets even more the bigger the memory you have. So it's important to use um, custom bit cells. OpenRAM, I should mention, also has what we call a parameterized bit cell. So this is actually a, a it's a, the layout is generated for a, a bit cell that's just not a very good bit cell, but it is a bit cell. So it's um, about 2x less efficient than the custom cell, but it's automatic. And so you can see here that that's even better than a latch or DFF array as well. Now, kind of the overview of what the uh, placement looks like. Basically, this is a very tiny memory just to illustrate all the placement of the things around it. So it looks kind of inefficient because it is so small. Um, basically, we use relative placement of blocks to be able to um, place things. For example, the address port and data ports are always placed on the left and bottom for one port and right and top for the other port. The control logic is always placed to the left of the address port row flops on top of that, the data flops on the bottom. In the kind of this little blank space in this example is where you would have a column decoder. So uh, this, this relative placement is used to basically simplify the routing. Right now, OpenRAM places with all these relative placements and then has fixed routes that are also relative. One of the things we want to do in the future is to add auto routing for the top level control signals. But you, that challenge there is you have to make sure that the signals are uh, timing correct and so on. So we, there, it's a limited routing. It's not very congested, so it's an easy routing. But we want to bring in uh, um, a router to do that. Then that will give us a little more place flexibility on kind of how we do this placement to reduce some of the overhead of these um, spacings in the periphery circuitry. 
Now, if we go back and look at this, you know, this is an example of the overhead of these parts with a big array. You can see it's not as significant when you get bigger memory arrays. Um, one of the optimizations that we've added recently is a channel router. So when you're connecting between two things on two layers, you basically want to um, have you know, row routes and then, and then track routes. And uh, you can see here, we do a simple left edge algorithm to route these, which has been improved since the tape out. The tape out didn't optimize this. So that's one thing we do. Um, the other thing is the supply routing in OpenRAM. There's actually multiple options for how we deal with the power supply. By default, all power supplies are brought up to a metal three pins. Um, and then if you turn on power supply routing, it can either generate a, a, a metal three, four grid. That's a blockage aware grid and it connects all of those pins to the grid. Um, this works fine with commercial tools. Um, we've used that in our previous design. Um, some tools, it doesn't work so well with the open road flow because they really want the pins on the periphery. So we're actually working on another one where um, instead of doing a full grid, we're actually just doing a power distribution tree. And this is reduces the amount of metal that's used. And then you can bring the pin to the edge of the periphery as well. So that's, it's implemented, but there's, um, it needs to be debugged on a few cases where you can have some blockage problems. Um, you know, not to go too long, but some of the things we use in OpenRAM are um, parameterized transistors. So we actually generate the layout for devices. It's not optimal, but what this does is it lets us um, do customized sizing for different drivers and the timing. Uh, so we have a parameterized transistor, um, you can change the number of fingers and so on. You can use this to generate parameterized cells like inverters, NANs, NORs, and so on in the control logic. And again, this is just so you can, and also precharge and column mux are implemented with these parameterized transistors and cells. Now, the idea here is these are not optimal cells, but they're good enough because they're not used very frequently. So the area is not super important. One of the long-term things we would like to do is basically if there is a better standard cell generator, um, we can actually plug that into OpenRAM and call it through an API. That would be one way to get some further reduction in area. But we've, till now, we've tried to keep it kind of independent of most external tools. But there's some good ones coming out that we could possibly use. Now, what are some of the known issues? I mentioned um, there is some DRC issues in Sky 130 that we fixed by hand. Um, mostly it's enclosure issues and a few abutting um, space issues. Uh, the multi-bank support's temporarily disabled, but it's there. Um, one issue is most of this development with OpenRAM is we've actually, I've actually done it with the, the Skywater proprietary PDK, so before the open PDK was released. So with that, it actually does proper checking of the core memory cell. The new magic setup for DRC is not, we're not yet using that, so we have to kind of know when to apply the core memory design rules as opposed to the periphery rules. Uh, we're in the process of fixing this right now so that we can do this with the open source PDK itself. Again, we're going to provide the pre-compiled memory IP. Um, we need to speed up characterization. It's very slow. That's a known problem with memories. And um, calibrate uh, the analytical models. Now, there's what can you all do? Well, help is wanted. I want people to help with the project. Um, we have things for software people, you know, quality of results scripts, um, improve logging. Um, fixing timing measurements, more flexibility and just log generation. Um, we have circuits jobs, um, making a user rules bit cell instead of one with OPC, that might be more flexible for some people. Fixing the BIST wrapper, adding static noise analysis to the memory cell. I mentioned that's very important to make sure your memory cell works. Other customized implementations, for example, the dynamic logic decoder that I mentioned a few times, someone could add that. Also some higher level stuff, EDA stuff. So generalizing the top level and doing auto routing to be able to um, do better floor planning at the top level and reduce some of that uh, space overhead. Uh, doing some improved testing, for example, using the lib files in, in static timing analysis. I've done that a couple times by hand with commercial and open source tools just to make sure they work, but we don't do that as part of our regression right now. Um, making unit tests for the Verilog model, stuff like that. So there's a lot of things that um, we'd be glad to help with. What does the open road, uh, roadmap look like? Well, we're basically getting the baseline memories out. We're gonna start working on open ROM, open reg files. So specifically for many ported register files rather than just up to two ports. 
And then also using the Sonos flash transistor to be able to do an open flash memory as well. That's kind of in the longer term roadmap. So the question I get here is when will I get the memory cells and IP? The next couple of weeks, next one to two weeks, we're gonna be rolling it out. We're trying to basically transition to the open PDK and then renaming the cells properly. That's changed a bunch of stuff. So once we get that done, we're gonna release everything in, in the public. So um, we can talk next week, or actually not next week, next month, Tim Edwards is gonna talk about magic, which we are going to be using for DRC when we get the open source stuff done. And I fixed the uh, memory core rules. Uh, that's November 17th and the Fosse talk. And if anyone's interested in grad school, master's or PhD, you can come and work on open source tools. It's actually not only me, we have several other faculty working on live hardware development and, and fast um, uh, logic simulation and things like that. So we have a group called the Hardware Systems Collective that uh, does all these things. This is about half the students actually. It's hard to get everyone in one place at one time. So, um, and the grad applications close in January. So think about that. So conclusions, I've presented OpenRAM. Um, it generates all the stuff you need to do open source uh, memory IP generation. We're porting to more technologies. Um, we're, we're interested in supporting people doing that. Uh, we're still actively developing new features and we're seeking feedback. So uh, if you have problems, join our Slack channel or join the OpenRAM channel on the OpenPDK Slack channel um, and give us feedback and, and patches if there's problems, we're happily accepting stuff. So I couldn't have done all this stuff without a bunch of people, uh, Tim Anzel, Tim Edwards, Mohammed Kassem and Shalan, and many, many others have contributed to OpenRAM over the time. So I can open it up for questions here. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it, Nicole, uh, the talk. Um, I think I learned a lot. <laughs> That's really good. Um, so we have a couple of questions, uh, and I think one you probably already answered between the lines, but maybe you can elaborate a little bit more. Um, the question is what the downside is of not having a shared address decoder. Sorry, not having a shared address decoder in multi-bank? Yes, exactly. Yeah, that would just be um, extra area. Yeah. So the address decoder consumes a little area. So if you split it up into having actual separate SRAMs it with like a Verilog wrapper to select which SRAM, you don't over you don't share that um, decoder area, so it's a little less efficient. So visually, and, and that, that, sorry. yeah, go ahead. And so visually on the slide that you had, is it like half the size that you would like? You would have the same size decoder if it's shared or not, right? Yeah, yeah. This decoder in the middle is the same size. It would be, it'd basically be duplicated for each of the banks okay. if they were separate. So you're not cutting in the middle and say, uh, that's no, no, sharing it, right? Awesome. Um, yeah. And one thing I noticed is you said that it won't finish if you run it for large uh, memories as in Rocket, right? The whole process. And I'm wondering, maybe you can elaborate if there's many software people here and many people that have left university quite a while ago, as I have. Um, so, so what's yeah. the process behind it that's running so long? Can you just say a few words about it? Yeah, so you can... It'll definitely generate um, layouts and it can do the analytical modeling, but if you want to do characterization, so simulation-based modeling, it's too slow. Mm -hmm. um, it, it basically, you're running spice simulation on this entire memory. One of the things you need to do is, uh, we use NG spice primarily, is to make sure to turn on um, the multi-core support. So the, uh, what is it? Um, blanking on the flag right now, but basically it'll evaluate the device models in parallel. Mm -hmm. And so you can use multi-threading to get speed up. So even doing that, that's still not so fast because you can do all the device modeling models in one time step, but then to go to the next time step, you basically have to solve a big matrix. Yeah. And so that simulation is just really slow. Yeah. Um, at one point we had some code in here that would basically remove stuff. So you can actually kind of remove things that you're not simulating. So say a bunch of the memory cells, but that we haven't been maintaining that just unit testing. So that would basically trim the net list to reduce the size. Um, that can help. Um, we can have, if someone wants to kind of bring that back, that'd be a good feature to add. Mm -hmm. The other thing is to basically, um, instead of doing simulation of the whole thing, just to do a representative like row column and so on. Mm -hmm. And so, so to generate timing models that you simulate instead. 
Uh, so that that'd be another thing that um, would be good to add at some point. But, but, but then if you like, start doing, but then if you start doing back annotated simulation, you have to make sure you at least keep like the adjacent thing so you have the appropriate capacitances and so yeah, on. Yeah. So it's not straightforward just to say we need one row, one column. Yeah. You need kind of a couple and so on. <laughs> yeah, as you said, that that's where the analog comes into play, right? <laughs> yeah. That's not funny part usually. Um, so uh, someone was asking if you can do content addressable memory with open RAM, would it be easy to extend or? Yeah, so the API, I mentioned um, open ROM, um, open reg file and open flash are things we wanna do. Content addressable memories also, I've, we've also had requests for serial access memories. So like mm -hmm. a special decoder to just go through. Um, all of those open RAM, at the outer level is really an API to an underlying data structure where we represent the circuit and the block interactions and so on. So basically making a new top level um, is possible for any type of memory. Mm -hmm. So yeah, content addressable memories are definitely on the list as well. Yeah, I, we're kind of attacking it from the most common down to the least common things. And so getting basic memory arrays working then getting register files, which are very common. Mm -hmm. Flash is obviously very common. So kind of doing that. So if people want to add these other specialized memories, I'm very interested in supporting people in that too. Mm -hmm. So if you're building a, a cache now, you use flops instead, right? For the tag. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, they, the actual tag data array, I guess I, I, when I've um, looked at Boom and those other ones, I, they use regular memories, but I guess they would kind of iterate through addresses maybe. Oh, I, see. I haven't yeah. looked at the architecture. Oh, I see. Okay, so they make it just a multi-cycle access to the same memory, I see. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering on slide 39, you um, showed the, the usual graph and it didn't have the left part. Um, so what's the cutoff point? Um, just a rough estimate um, between DFF and, um, and SRAM in your technology now. Yeah, it's, it's basically around like, you know, 100, I, it depends on the technology, but it's you know somewhere in the range of 50 to 100 bits. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I didn't actually zoom in there. It's actually a lot lower than people think. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you go I by always just- learn, like the register file, which I explained to my students, right? The register file is not yeah. registers, right? Yeah, if you just go by the area of a DFF compared to the memory cell, that gives you kind of the, the limit. So mm -hmm. you know, the single port was basically a 5X, the dual port is roughly a three to four X difference. Mm. So converting from DFFs to that, you can do that. Now, that of course, you also have the, the decoder and selection logic mm -hmm. with the register files and so on. And so that adds some additional overhead. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. And um, I think the next question is kind of fundamental <laughs> a little bit. Um, so the question is what the advantages are between having a large SRAM on the SOC and the external RAM. I think speaking specifically about your experience in timing and um, yeah, how it influences. Yeah, I mean, th when you go off chip, you're going to end up being limited in speed at some point, right? You know, high performance I/O and pins. Yeah, high performance mm -hmm. I/O is challenging. So, I think the general idea is to have you know kind of primary memories on chip. You can look at the way processors have gone. You know, you originally had the first caches on chip and last caches off chip. They've tried to bring them on as they get bigger and bigger, um, higher and higher densities. So it's just, yeah, number of pins and performance is basically the reason. Yeah. Uh, so someone is asking, do you know what the rough scale of onboard SRAM, I think it's on chip, uh, is in terms of size performance uh, for Skywater 130? Is it one meg, 10 meg, 100 meg? Um, I actually, I'm not sure what they mean by performance. So I think the simulation of that memory I was doing was, um, a simulation at about 100 megahertz for the one kilobyte for uh, the functional I mean, simulations I, I, think, I was doing. Yeah, I think the question is about like what the maximum size is that you would say is workable with this kind of Ah, so, so what we do with OpenRAM is we kind of, we let the user shoot themselves in the foot, so to speak. Uh, we don't <laughs> limit. Basically, if the simulations pass, it works. Okay. Um, so you can simulate it and then kind of debug it if it's not mm. working. Um, you know, right now we have a limit in the number of rows. Um, I actually expanded that a couple of weeks ago where you can have, I forget, we, 
we can have a maximum of 8k rows i think okay with the de with the decoder yeah. um so that that's a limit but you'll probably hit other performance limits much before that yeah. i mentioned the bit line capacitance if you get the bit line too long um basically the bit cell can't really drive the bit line capacitance enough and then there's all this leakage on the bit line Mm -hmm. So you kind of get into these analog limits yeah. <laughs> and, and it, it, if it gets too tall, it just won't work. Right. So, so, so what did you I, say? I haven't, mm -hmm. so I, I haven't actually simulated what that is in these technologies, but it'll be, it'll depend on each technology. Yeah. So from a rough experience, what would you say is the, 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 the relation between like the decoder and other control logic compared to analog effects on the, on the maximum speed that you can apply. Um, you're saying like... So like there's the logic depth on the decoder, right? That That's limiting, mm -hmm. right? Beyond 8K lines is probably yeah. pretty large, right? Um, and on the other hand, there's the, 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 the analog effects, right? What would you say? Yeah. What's the... I think the analog effects are more limiting, yes. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's going to be the barrier, really. OK. Awesome. Um, I think there are no more yeah. questions. Actually, one additional thing, the reason we expanded to the 8K as well is when you add the redundancy for um, the built-in self-repair, we made it so that the, you don't have to have a full address decoder anymore. So you don't mm -hmm. have to have a multiple of, of two or a power of two. I um, so you can, have, you can have, for example, a 129 <laughs> row memory array. And we don't generate the full 256-bit address decoder. We just generate the bits we need. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's why we wanted to make sure to have the 8K number of rows. So you can actually go to 4,097, right? <laughs> oh, that's great. That, yeah. Okay, I think we're out of questions. All Does right. Anyone have one? Last minute one? <laughs> and, uh... Oh, yeah, the question was a little bit about um, the one before. Um, like comparing throughput of an SRAM that you would have for one chip SRAM, what would you like say is a rough number that you can get compared to DRAM, which is in the orders of hundreds of gigabytes? Adding, of course, that the latency yeah. is an issue there, right? Oh, um, I mean, I don't want to estimate that. I just, okay. <laughs> obviously DRAM, you're going to have other issues with like ref refresh and things like that. So SRAM is probably an order of magnitude faster. Yeah. Um, I'm just ballparking that. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm just wondering, like that's the last one for me then. Um, how did you get, like, it's pretty exotic corner of BLSI, right? Um, the memory <laughs> compiler. Like, so, so, so what part of your life did you decide to say, this is my thing now? <laughs> what did you yeah, that's a good question. Or, or after that? I think a lot of people try to do try to jump on kind of the hot topics of the day. And I was trying to find basically the topic that no one's looking at, <laughs> right? You know, what is, what is no one working on that might be interesting? Uh. And back in the early 2000s, when I was in grad school, um, it was basically really hard to get like libraries. Mm -hmm. So, you know, standard cell libraries and the, and the config files and so on. They didn't even really think about memories then because it was just, you didn't have libraries. <laughs> and kind of doing some designs now, we can see that same situation with memories where you can get a lot of libraries now, you know, like James last month presented the open source libraries and so on. So you can get those, but then you still don't have memory IP. Yeah. And so then you, then you have a lot of computer architects, you know, that are just generating black box models of memories. You know, oh, I don't know how fast it'll be, but I'm just going to use cacti and say yeah. it's a three cycle memory that works at 400, giga, or 400 megahertz. Yeah. And and kind of just totally just ballparking it. Yeah. And so I wanted something that can tie together basically the actual implementations and the architecture people, yeah. so that the architects can use real data. But then you can also see if you change something in the memory how it's going to affect the architecture. Yeah. So kind of being able being able to do these vertical studies of basically a design flow. And this I is one thing that was kind of yeah. yeah. This is one thing that was just missing in that gap yeah. or that that study so yeah it is what i remember from my own phd right like you could get access to like even if you're a university you could get access to standard cells but memory compilers are pretty restricted right if you go for commercial ones mm -hmm. and, um, it was always like you had this as you say like the black box in your papers <laughs> like this is where the memory yeah. is probably 
Um, yeah, and then, but even and then the other issue is, there was, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and then the other issue is, you know, if you do have a memory compiler, some of them are very limited in what they do. Like it's, you can generate these, you know, two dozen sizes, yeah. two dozen configurations. That's all it does. Yeah. So if you want something that's, you know, very specific, you have to kind of round up in your sizes. And yeah, that's true. Pick the best thing available. Thanks a lot. It's really interesting. I really appreciate your work. Hope to get some hands on. I think everyone is. <laughs> um, now yeah. it's a good time to start. I think you learned the majority of things. Next talk is as you introduced by Tim about Magic uh, DFC, um, which is probably last missing link in building your own chip um, that you can be kind of sure that it actually works. <laughs> um, thanks a lot, Matt. It was really great. Everyone was really thrilled uh, attending the, the presentation. Um, again, as, as James was last time, um, you could see that like, you're an educator, right? You were explaining it very good from, from ground <laughs> up. I think everyone could follow. Um, really great. Thanks a lot. Have a great yep. day. Everyone stay safe. Um, great. Thanks, everybody. See you next month. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.